Hello and welcome to the first episode of Monday Morning Manager. My name is Dylan Meehan, I'm a writer for City Extra and I've written about Manchester City for years and I'm really excited to be one of the new faces and voices joining the City Extra YouTube channel. Firstly, I wanna give a massive thank you to Freddie and Jordan for even letting me join the channel and I'm really excited to see where this show can go. The first guest for the first episode is gonna be Amos Murphy from the City Ramble podcast a massive fan and funny enough he's the first person i ever really talked about this show with at a cafe when i'm in manchester when i was visiting i'm really excited for y'all to see this it's mostly just going to be a conversation about arsenal and the rodri injury as well as what the implications are going to look like for the short term future of the season so yeah that's the opening here's the interview with amos amos how are you doing no, it's nice. It's it's lovely. Full circle. I remember it. It was a. Um, I would like to say it was a lovely. I think it was a lovely day in Manchester. They do exist. Um, we sat in a, a a cafe in the northern quarter. Idols hands. I think it was. Um, yeah. yeah, stunning, stunning. It's great. It's great to be doing it. It's really nice to be here. I mean, I think kind of the main thing to talk about uh, for at least for the first topic is going to be obviously the, the match against Arsenal at the weekend. Pretty conflicting a set of emotions throughout the entire match and think about it just the context without like without the performances first just do you v- review the result a 2-2 draw when you're you know when you were losing for most of the match do you view that as a success or do you think that it was you know more to be mm. more to be desired in isolation i think you look at the result and without the context say city should probably have done much more with the context, you probably say they should have done much more, but also with the same context, you probably say a draw was a fair result. You know, it is one of the most confusing games I think I've ever gone away from because I just I just didn't know what to think. Usually you sat there, you're watching it play out, you know, if you're supporting one team, you're supporting the other, who the enemy, who the villains are, you know, who the hero, what the narrative is, you know all of that. But honestly, on, on Sunday when City played Arsenal, I was just there like, I have no idea what's going on. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. What was the, is it more from the refereeing decisions? Was it more from how Arsenal playing on the pitch? It was, it was absolutely everything. I mean, like most of the time you will say like, you've either got a grudge against the ref, you've got a grudge against the setup. Very, very, very rarely you're, especially, you know, being City and, and, and with Guardiola, you've got a grudge against the players or you've got a grudge against the setup or whatever. There was at one point in the second half, I was genuinely like, I hate everyone on the pitch. There, there is nobody <laughs> here that I have, I have good words for because, I mean, starting with City, look, I, I mean, I imagine it's incredibly difficult and having played football myself, I know what it's like when you're trying to break down a defence that is so bunkered as that. But it just felt like every single person was in the wrong place at points in that second half. You had Ruben Diaz trying to be the the master of ceremonies on the edge of the box, sort of trying to impersonate prime Andrea Pirlo. You had Manuel Akanji, you know, bless him. Absolutely love the guy, but he's not Vincent Kompany sending it top bins against Leicester in 2019. Yeah. And the maddest one, you had Phil Foden sat on the bench until the 70th minute. The king, as we saw last year, the king of outside the box goals. So, um yeah, and you know the referee as well was just abysmal. I just, I think the watching Ruben Diaz play the Rodri role was not something I was going to expect mm. against maybe the second best team in Europe, if not certainly the second best team in England. Um, it was, it was pretty shocking. Uh, there was the one Kyle Walker shot from distance, which, albeit, actually wasn't terrible. It wasn't um, a bad but, one. It was on target at least. But didn't, uh, Shockingly, it didn't go in. Um, and I think the only other thing, too, is it's like as I'm watching, and it's very rarely am I like, I know more than Pep. Very rarely am I like going to be like this. <laughs> yeah. I, I, but it, I was watching it, and never once were they going to the byline. And I don't know if that was either you know, they're worried about somehow the, the header would spur, you know, if it was to be headed mm. away or cleared away, it would spur a counterattack or, or what. But I'm just watching them quite literally what felt like for 45 minutes just pass it around the mm. edge of the 18 yard box waiting for space to come when there's 10 Arsenal players in the box. And it was... It, it, was, it, it wasn't even like I felt that was the wrong approach because I, I, I agree, you know, you, you don't want to just sort of be spamming crosses into the box, breaking up play, giving Arsenal the chance yeah. to sort of... Not that they would counter outside of their 18-yard box, but giving them the chance to at least touch the football and, and maybe Kai Havertz would have been able to complete a pass. But it was just more... It, it, it was just more how how repetitive it was and like i said before how it was it 
it was maybe the right idea, but at times, certainly the wrong people were there. Um, you know, look, it, it's by the by, I'm sure they'll go back and they'll analyse it and they'll learn from the mistakes. There were a few weird decisions in that game, I felt, even going back to the first half, where you started out with Jeremy Doku trying to mark Gabriel on a corner, on a set, you know, the king of set pieces. If they have got anything going for themselves, it is the fact they do really well at set pieces, Arsenal. And then you change it over and you've got Kyle Walker trying to play TIG with him inside the box. And then, you know, there was, there was a few spooky decisions, I felt. But um, to get away with a point, sort of, I think, injury aside, I think you say, OK, fair enough. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. Status quo remains on to the rest of the season. Yeah, and to, to talk about the injury, so there was a whole lot of talk immediately when it happened that it was deliberate, that Arsenal were like trying to, you know, injure Rodri. While I I personally definitely think they were trying to like I do think you try to be physical with any mm-hmm. of like a team's best player. What do you think they were instructed in any way just to target him? Not from an injury standpoint. Like I I just don't even want to go down that route because I don't think it's realistic. But do you think there were instructions to like just, just get physical with him. You know, always be on him. You know, from from the from the jump. I, I think that. what well, I mean, you, you centre forward. I'm hesitant to say centre forward because you know most centre forwards would at least complete a pass throughout the game. Um, runs into him. You're really I, going for this. this honestly, is... <laughs> I, 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 it's a good job this is a city a city show because <laughs> some stern words could be said. Um, but I don't think I don't think if that isn't the instruction, you don't have a player, regardless of what who that player is, I don't think you have a player, try and clothesline them or barge straight into them seven seconds into the game. And, and look, at, weirdly enough, I've not seen a, a, a genuine replay of the incident. There's no, it, there's no real clip of it. it you just get like, the two clips exist. from the start of the... Yeah. I couldn't believe <laughs> it. I, 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 don't, I have, have 500,000 Arsenal fans breathing down my neck right now from a tweet that I sent out, just talking about how the Holland and Havertz challenges were similar. And how Havertz's challenge set the tone, and it's like, yeah, no one knows. Like, you can't get. It's crazy. In twenty twenty four, there's not a single clip <laughs> of. It's like in fifty the, years, the yeah. FBI will release the uh, the, the footage. <laughs> the um, new Zapruder film is the Havertz Rodri challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the conspiracies have been wild, but look, I, you don't have that if you're not trying to unsettle. I think is the word yeah. we've probably yeah. could. We could we could agree on um, Inja. I don't think so. I'm going to give them a modicum of of respect and say I don't think they were trying to do that. But I think they were trying to unsettle. But as we know, all it takes is a, a need to plan. Yeah. And look, I'm, I'm, the Arsenal player who who was who was marking Rodri at that corner. I, I don't think he's doing anything untoward that any other defender. I mean, I would have liked Kyle Walker for starters to be a bit more physical and a bit closer in, in a similar vein. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just unfortunate that his leg gets planted. It's a physical game. You know, it could have been against Brentford. It could have been against Inter Milan. It, it, that was, a, in my opinion, a coincidence. But the overall theme, the overall tone, I do think they were trying to target them. Um, why? Why they're turning up with this sort of big boy, bad attitude? I, I, I don't know. I think this has been one of the biggest takeaways that Arsenal like to try and present themselves as this holy team, the you know the football savior, the 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 descendant from Pep Mikel Arteta, who's doing it the right way. There's no hundred and fifteen charges over this club, you know, blah 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 blah. But dark arts are fine. Absolutely, go for dark arts. Mourinho made a career out of it. Just own it, I think. And that's been my biggest sort of irritation is the fact that they just try and pretend it doesn't exist. But yeah, yeah, yeah. we're yeah, sat yeah. there watching it. They still think it's like Wenger's arsenal and that there's <laughs> yeah. nothing there's like nothing else going on at play. Absolutely. Yeah. I get you. Mm. Yeah, I mean I think it's the it's a little bit of a it's a cliche. I don't even say it's a little bit of a cliche. It's absolutely a cliche, the like over emotional antics. And I think that's what happens because Arteta, you know, once Arteta admits it, it just they're gonna get labeled that. But you look at the cheap yellow cards that like that picks up when you play like that, it's going to pick up cheap yellow cards. And then that has the, not every time, it has the potential to, you know, get back at you. You think of like with Rice knocking mm. the ball away against Brighton, picking up the red card. People were freaking out about it. And it's like, well, that, that is a, it's a yellow card. It's a really cheap yellow card. It's a really dumb yellow card. But like, it, they've started doing this since last year where they're going to card you for it. Same thing with, uh, with Trossard. I think, honestly, 
the foul alone was yellow card worthy. I thought that's originally what it was. was, He just dove into it. He just shot, he shoulder barged him WWE style into Bernardo's back. And then look, some people want to say he was playing the ball. He booted it. Like he punted it in the air. He's a good footballer. Like, yeah, like that is not a free ball. That is, that is hitting the wrong button on FIFA, isn't it? That's trying to play the flute, play the free ball, but accidentally (laughs) sending it, lobbing it, you know, don't kid me with that. And, yeah. and the other part on the Trossard one, um, I think he claimed himself, and Arsenal fans have claimed, and, and probably Arteta, if he even dared say anything, would claim it himself, that Trossard didn't hear the whistle. Well, he was he was the guy who made the foul in the first yeah. place. So he, what did he think was going to happen when he was doing that? <laughs> it's the excuses. It's honestly, it's the excuses. It's the conspiracies. It's the... And, it, and it's not this City game in isolation. It's that every time Arsenal drop points, the, there has to be a reason. The, you know, it's somebody else's fault. They, they cannot, and like I say, they cannot own, they cannot own it. Um, two weeks after Declan Rice gets sent off for delay, delaying the restart of play, what do you not do in your biggest game of the season? Boot it away when you're on a yellow card. Seconds before halftime. Nonsense. Yeah, yeah it's... it's... I, I couldn't believe it. It's just the, the 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 lack of understanding of context in that moment. It's just I don't know. And then I guess the 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 one last thing specifically in regards to this game is I just I don't think Michael Oliver is a terrible referee. I think that I think there's too much bad refereeing talk overall. I just think that that is like an exhausting subject and like the talk of how we needed VAR and then how VAR is the worst thing and it's just like it it is terrible. But at first he wasn't you know, really controlling things. And then it led to the, what happens an overcorrection. You're giving out a ton of cards then as just a way to try to calm things down. And look, by the end, we've got Holland throwing, you know, throwing footballs in the back of players' heads and, you know, all hell has broken loose at, at full time. How did you feel like what, like, what do you think he could have done better if anything at all? Yeah. It, 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 is Michael Oliver a bad referee? No. Did he have a bad game? Yeah. And, and I, I sort of, hear people online and, and in group chats and whatever sort of bemoaning the state of English refereeing. And okay, fair enough, it, it isn't great, but I have the pleasure, or in some cases, the displeasure through work for watching a hell of a lot of European football. And I don't just mean Milan versus Inter or Barca Real Madrid. I mean, Hitafe versus Real Betis, you know, a, a stinky La Liga, you know, one, and, and this, you know, very fortunate. No disrespect to, to the wonderful clubs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but then you, you do see bad refereeing in those yeah. leagues and like really, really bad. I, I think overall English referees are okay. Have they got stuff to work on? Absolutely. I just think he had a stinking game, a really, really stinking game. And you might he might be sat there after the game going, well, the players brought it upon themselves. Kai Havertz running into Rod- uh, Rodri after seven seconds. You know, they, uh, you know, two, it takes two to tango. I guess if he gives a yellow card out after seven seconds, he's almost set the tone himself. So I do see where you know both sides come from it. But it just felt it felt it felt needly. It, it felt quite ugly and and quite toxic at times. Um, how how you combat that? I, I, I don't know. Do you do you? give out more yellow cards, do you give out less yellow cards? I do think there's something to be said about, you know, the social media era and how every single sort of second of play is... If if a yellow card is given out for one thing, for example, Trossard kicking the ball away, an Arsenal fan or whatever club fan has already got the clip of Doku nudging it back, you know, even though I didn't think that was a yellow card anyway, he was... And Passing Oliver, is, Oliver is instructing him to kick the ball <laughs> He's that telling him too, to do that, <laughs> exactly, yeah. But, you know... It, it feels like everything, if there's going to be one moment, there's going to be four that someone else will bring up. And I, I yeah. think that does not help referees because they'll be second guessing themselves. Michael Oliver, I don't think he would have wanted to send Trossard off five seconds before half time or whatever it was. But he's seen with his own eyes the whistle go, firstly, the foul will be committed by him, the whistle go, and then the ball kick. And he goes, Well, if I don't send him off now on a yellow card, he- that's going to be tomorrow's headline. The the angle from behind the net, he's punting that ball. It's not like yeah. it, it, yeah. it. He is absolutely punting it, and it, it does like it, it's crazy. Mm. Um, and I guess I can understand why why players could think that he or or fans could think that he's trying to play it. But from that angle, which looks like the angle that Oliver has, it's not even it's not even close. Mm. No, totally. um, the only other thing to kind of talk about, I guess, in relation to this game and and oh, kind of so far with the season. 
look, it's back to back games after you know City win the first, I think like five matches is in the row if you count the the community shield. Looking like the best team in the league, looking like they were gonna, you know, win a treble again. Now coming back from you know the the first international break, it's back to back draws, albeit against two of some of the best teams in Europe who really found a way to just pack the box like and and prevent City from doing anything. De Bruyne has a a slight injury. Rodri seemingly is now out for the season. Hopefully, we'll, you know, we'll find something else. We're recording this Tuesday uh, before the before the Watford match. Do you think it's a little bit of a cause of concern, or is this just, hey, we've we faced two of the best teams in Europe that know how to defend, and and this is going to happen? Mm, uh, yeah, p- performance wise, I think it's it's more so against Inter. I thought City were were fine. You know, they they probably didn't create as much as they would have wanted to. But it was the first game in this new league phase. There were seven more matches. Not losing that game was probably more important than winning it, let's be honest, uh, even though it would have been great to get the victory. The Arsenal performance, I'm putting it down to just being a big game. And, and we know what Pep, we, we, we've seen it a million times before. Now Guardiola will think of something and it might not work. And look, City's best player went off. And then 60 seconds later, Arsenal scored a depending on how you see it, and either a fluky goal or a wonder goal. That changed the dynamic like that, and suddenly whatever you had, because the first 15 minutes was fantastic, genuinely sort of gripping, scintillating football. So the next 75 minutes, whatever it is, you can put down to just being a one-off. Getting through that game without losing, I think, is was paramount, absolutely. Yeah. Um, giving Arsenal the edge of having won at the Etihad under those circumstances especially would have been horrific. So I think I think that's fine. You know, performance-wise, is absolutely fine. But given the added subtext of De Bruyne again looking flaky, Rodri going to be missing until, let's face it, minimum spring 2025. Okay, deep breath. This could be... This could be... It could be interesting. Um, I'm, I'm not sort of in the camp of writing City off from all competitions. But look, um, it had been far too easy to win every game 5 nil and storm to a quadruple this is i i quietly imagine guardiola's relishing the challenge he's not going to be excited he's not going to be happy but i think he'll be sat there in his in his drawing room no doubt with a, a lovely bottle of red saying hmm, okay bring it on speaking of guardiola you know relishing this challenge so we've seen you know this is this was rodri's first premier league start only as i'm pretty sure only his second start of the season i think inter was his first um Kovacic and Rico in the first few games of the season honestly looked pretty comfortable operating, mm. you know, in this not quite I mean, I guess it is a double pivot, as basically in that kind of role, helping, you know, facilitate, you know, the ball all around the pitch. Do you think that that is something that that's who we're going to see in that role for the season? Do you think it might be 18 19 where Gundawan is going to take a step back? Do you think that maybe Kev will potentially play in a slightly deeper role? Do you, do you have an idea of where you think Guardiola then might take this? Uh, shorthand, no, but I don't think I think it would be foolish for anybody to sit here and say they did. Um, I, th- I think my overall my overall feeling will be it will be replacement by committee in the sense that don't expect City to play in the same way they have done. Or don't, at least don't expect the midfield to set up the same way they have done because you're not getting. Rodri is worth two players. That's why he's so good. That's why he's a Ballon d'Or contender because he's firstly and, and you know foremost the the best defensive midfielder. Honestly, that I think we've seen in the Premier League ever. Uh, you can maybe have a conversation about Europe. I'm sure uh, one of other Pep's ex-players would have something to say about it. But crucially for me, I think where City will lack his presence the most is going the opposite way because, well, you saw it in the second half. Kovacic isn't that conductor. He isn't that sort of metronome at the base of midfield. He can't... He, he, he doesn't have it in his repertoire, which is absolutely fine. He's not He's not that profile. Um, so I think you will need somebody like Rico Lewis next to him. He's a little bit more ball dominant, can maybe pick those intricate passes in the tighter spaces. I think at times Gundwan will have to sit there, which, look, I've seen people praising, rightly so, you know, getting Gundwan across the line um, late in the transfer window was, was massive. But at the same time, and understandably, you can't foresee this, but at the same time, he wasn't being brought in to, to play no doubt, 35 <laughs> matches this season. You know, it was always yeah. a case of, oh, he's going to plug the gap when needed, not be the guy who's who's going to do it. So, look, it'll be a challenge. I mean, can we donate muscles to John Stones? Is that 
something that it, it seems unethical from a medical perspective. But I think if if City are going to do anything this season, it probably rely on him being yeah. fit. Um, so yeah, I think it's it poses a problem. Do I do I know the answer? No, and that's why I'm sat here speaking to you, Dylan. Unfortunately. <laughs> Everyone's going to head down to Manchester City Centre to uh, start donating various ligaments <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and everything mm. else to make sure that, that Stones can finish the season healthy. Um, look, I think there are... After the summer, both of us had, we had, we had talked about this you know, online, you know, and there were a lot of comparisons or potential comparisons to the 2019 season um, of where you know company retires... City can't um, bring in a, a center back to replace him for a variety of reasons. It wasn't for lack of trying. Um, and then within the first few matches, Sané tears his ACL, Laporte tears his hamstring, comes back, immediate injury again as soon as he comes back. It seems, in the moment, it seemed crazy that there wasn't going to be a Rodri backup. And then after the first few games, we're seeing Kovacic and Rico in that role. Oh, perfect. It handles it. And then now we're just handled with that reality of like, hey, Rodri's probably going to be out for the season. And he's not going to be this, if it truly is an ACL injury, he's not going to be the same player potentially for mm. at least a year. Um, do you think this is like, it's all on Cheeky and Pep for not planning this? Or is this just, hey, this is a freak injury and you can't inherently plan for that. I, I've been battling this thought because I've seen quite a few tweets saying, you know, forget hindsight. This was this was clear from the off. And, and actually, I, I don't know. Look, look, what what's the alternative sort of outcome here? Obviously, a, a much better one, a much better reality where Rodri hasn't got a torn ACL. But City, whatever, bar maybe 15 games a season where you're talking Watford at home, you're talking... I don't, he probably would have started Bratislava away in the Champions League. You know, he is a player who, no matter what fixture, makes City better. And a little bit like Haaland, you're going to play him whenever he's available. At times, when he's probably overcooked, when he's 80%, but because it, he is so paramount. So, OK, you say you go out and you buy a, 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 a Bruno Gimaraes, for example, 100 million quid. He's just going to... He's not going to have a. You'd hope he wouldn't have the same effect as Calvin Phillips and sort of sit there and and not really do much. But it's you're going to encounter similar problems. Mateus Nunes, for example, I think he's got an absolute perfect role to play in City's team, but the standards are so impeccably high to just have somebody there, not for the sake of it, but just to have somebody there and spend the money there. It, you know. It, it, it it causes its own problems, and it's, a, it's perfect to say now. Imagine we have Bruno Gimraes, ironically, away at Newcastle uh, on Saturday afternoon. You know that'd be that'd be fantastic. But if Rodri stays fit for the whole season, how much football does Bruno generally play? I, you know, I don't know. Maybe they address it in the in the January window. Um, Twenty games, I think it is, sort of including the Watford Cup match. Yeah, it, I don't know. It, it, it the, the positive is um, if there's any positives, it's happened now. It's happened mid September because had this come November and you sort of you're a month away from the transfer window, do you stick or twist? I don't know. We can maybe see for ten matches how it runs, and you might go, well, "No, actually, it's still really good here, and there's no point in just buying for the sake of it." Or it might be a car crash, and then suddenly you you do need to reinvest. Yeah. And I uh, I guess just to kind of immediately segue into that, do you think they will enter the, the market in January? Because I don't I don't know, honestly, who they could go for for that same reason. Anyone that they bring in, they might play for the next six months and they might be the guy for the next six months. And then as soon as Rodri comes back, Off it's like back to the end of the it's back to the end <laughs> of the bench. Mm, um it would be hilarious if City got Zuba Mendy because of the whole thing with Liverpool. I think there, there, there was a there was stories last week at the time of recording that he regretted not moving to the Premier League, not joining Liverpool. And I imagine if City and Guardiola come sniffing, that's that's something you can't turn down. Um, I guess I guess you know you're looking at the obvious is Zuba Mendy, Bruno Gimaraes. This is and this is again this is a problem. You know who do you do? Do you do you Maybe go someone a little bit older. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Not too many examples who can the, be a stopgap. The only one that I can think is is, and I don't think it's been real between the links is Kimmich. Mm. 
Yeah. I mean, that's that be great. The, with the hit, like he has, he can play it as in both the right back role and then step in uh, centrally. It just seems like, but I've always just felt that it's a contract play. All those links have just been so that he can get the biggest contract possible at, at Bayern. And I can't imagine one of Bayern's most senior players, who, by the way, I mean, they look incredible under company right now. Just like absolutely unbelievable. I can't imagine him wanting to A, leave that, and then B, them doing it to go to like former manager and, you know, best team in the world, most likely at that time, Manchester City. Yeah, um, that'd be, that'd maybe be the dreamy pick. Again, though, even even in the height of summer, I wasn't too convinced on those links. Um, yeah. it, it felt a bit like fluff and, and nothing really sort of genuine. But look, this plays out there. It's just whether or not City going to go for them. Um, it feels like there's there's a few elite players, but they're obviously not going to come in. Um, everything below that, in that position, I don't know if it's blessed at the moment. It's, it's really difficult, really difficult. And especially at that, to be a like Pep Guardiola level player, it's a very, yeah. very particular profile that very few players have really ever been able to live up to. And it's just, you're not going to find that person that's like, oh, hey, you're going to play 10 to 15 <laughs> matches a season. But right now we need you to play the next 25, mm. 30 matches against the best teams in the world. Mm. Frustrating. And then just to kind of look, looking ahead, um, specifically at predictions. So... What are your expectations with Rodri most likely going to be out for this season? Do you think it's still the the push for trophies is realistic or do you really think this might be like a 1920 situation? Good question. I, I I imagine it will depend on injuries to other players and that's a really simplistic answer but if De Bruyne is out for a, a bit a bit longer or say City lose one of the centre defenders, you know, Ruben Diaz, Phil, you know, a player of that ilk, Jesus Fingers crossed, you know, early in Ireland, we've got a, yeah. hopefully not got to speak it into existence, but it's a possibility. Then you start looking at 20, 2019, 20. If there's going to be injuries, Haaland's going to miss games. I'm, I'm almost certain of it um, because he has to. There's no backup striker. He can't play every single fixture. But if City manage to limit those injuries to four or five games at a piece, I, I, I think the Premier League is certainly still a possibility. Yeah. My fear is the Champions League, not because of the added schedule that I've seen other people suggest. It's more when you get to the knockout rounds. Look, City, the best team in Europe, in my opinion, a level above Real Madrid over the last couple of years um, in terms of consistency, in terms of sort of overall quality. But it's, as we've seen far too often, it's the 180 minutes across two legs where you simply, by hook or crook, need your best 11 players out there, at least to begin with, and then, you know, whatever off the bench, you need you need your best team out there. And City, no matter what in, sort of inventive solution Guardiola can come up with, are not going to be nearly as good as they are with Rodri and the team. And, and, and I just fear in those matches, come the spring, fingers crossed, if there is a quarterfinal, if there is a semifinal, by God, if there is a final, Rodri... <laughs> Speaking of muscle donations, you can have my entire leg. Um, I just, I just hope there is. I, 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 I do fear. I do fear that there is sort of maybe that would be a step too far. But look, that is that is well and truly down the line. City should qualify for the knockouts. I think what is interesting, sort of looking at the fixture list, is. I actually think it becomes more important to avoid finishing ninth and 24th in this new Champions League. I think they have to, as much as possible, prioritise getting into the top eight to avoid the extra two games in the playoff. But other than that, I think the Premier League should be in in there or thereabouts. I don't think we should be having rights if City don't win a fifth Premier League title in a row anyway with Rodri, (laughs) but especially not now. Um, um, But otherwise, otherwise, I think, look, now Pep and Cheeky ten- out. This is this <laughs> yeah, is unacceptable. Yeah. You say that there'll be some there'll be some oh, absolute yeah, yeah, yeah some absolute clowns saying that. But I, I think ask me again in ten games because it could very easily go either way um, in that period. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and speaking of asking you in ten games, and when you just look at like some of the the immediate fixture up ahead, it's Newcastle away, Fulham, Wolves away, and then Southampton as the league games. Until mm. you know the until November and the November fixture starts to get heavier. There's matches against Brighton and and Tottenham, and then there's a, a Liverpool matchup in, in December as well. 
it seems like a pretty decent. I mean, Newcastle away is going to be a difficult, a difficult fixture. Always has in the, in the new era for Newcastle, but this seems like a little bit of a, a decent ramp of games to kind of play with and figure out, and for Guardiola to be like, hey, who is going to fit in this role? Um, personally, I think when you City have normally have their midseason slumps historically, this seems like a decent stretch of games, truly to avoid that. Uh, but what do you mm. what do you think? No, totally. Um, if you're going to pick a fixture run up until, like you say, I think it's around the end of October where things start to ramp up a little bit, in, including Champions League games in there. Um, I think you probably go for something like this. I think there's a couple of of, of competitions, uh, cup competitions, so you're at home as well, obviously, depending on what happens with, with the Carabao Cup. I, I, that's manageable, totally. Saturday against Newcastle, you can smell a drop point or two there, I think, just given the sort of the, the immediate shock and trying to get over that. Hey, you could see a, a 3-0 victory and they blow them away. Look, I, I don't know. But I think after that, you say, OK, fair enough. This is a good four or five games where, where Pep Guardiola will be able to lay down his plans, lay down his options, try a couple of things out. I'd be mightily shocked if we saw the same midfield base slash center back partnership for four or five games in a row, I think we're going to see different combinations. And at the end of that, you're going to go, okay, fair enough. This works better than that. Let's try and push through it. Um, so yeah, that's a positive. Um, like I say, it's come at a good time. If this had happened in a month's time, where you were gearing up for the United, the Spurs, the Villa, etc., then yeah, that would be much more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, perfect. I don't really have, <clears throat> I don't think I have much else. I, I appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you coming on again um, <laughs> with uh, for for the first episode, and thank you so much. Uh, once again, Amos Murphy from City Rebel Podcast. Please, please check it out. Thank you so much for for being the first guest. My pleasure. Thank you all so much for watching, and once again, thank you to Amos Murphy for being the first guest on the show. Please check out the City Ramble podcast if you haven't done that already. In the show notes, I'm going to put all the social media handles for both myself and Amos. If you want to follow me on Twitter or follow the show on Instagram, that will all be in there. Please like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend, all that stuff. Thank you all so, so much, and I'll see you all next week.